I've always found the concept of an invasive species pretty terrifying. This idea that you can take an ecosystem that's thrived for hundreds, if not thousands of years, and completely tear it apart simply by introducing a single new species is insane to me. One of the craziest examples is a brown tree snake that was accidentally introduced to Guam after World War II and completely destroyed the island bird population. It basically turned the common sighting of the Guam broadbill into complete extinction in just 40 years. Then there's the Yunnan Lake Newt, the Guam Kingfisher, the European Crayfish and the Christmas Sandpiper. The list goes on, all species that thrived for years until a deadly predator came along out of nowhere and completely destroyed them. But as human beings, we've always been the ones responsible for introducing invasive species to new, helpless ecosystems. We've never had to worry about the concept ourselves because although it might not always seem like it, we are the dominant species on Earth. Besides the odd plague here or there, the closest we come to extinction is by our own hands. But could you imagine if there was a species introduced that could challenge our status as the dominant species on Earth? Something so unstoppable our very existence comes into question. That's exactly what John Kroninsky asked when he created The Quiet Place. There's a quote from an interview that perfectly sums it up. Most alien movies are about takeovers, agendas. They're a thinking alien creature. And for me, this idea of a predator, this idea of a parasite, this idea of something that is introduced to an ecosystem, that was interesting to me. One of my favourite movies I love to watch is Rock and Roller, and they tell the whole story about the crayfish in the Thames. And that's what I mean, the introduction is something that can't be held back. He essentially asked what would happen if the greatest ecosystem in the world, planet Earth, had introduced to it the ultimate invasive species. A species so ferocious and so dangerous, it would be like releasing walls into a daycare centre. And that idea birthed this monstrosity, the Death Angel. A creature pretty much born and raised in hell, on a planet with no light, crushing levels of gravity and a danger beyond anything we could ever imagine. All of which moulded the evolution of hearing so advanced it makes bat echolocation sound like a wet fart. Virtually impenetrable armour that even an implosion of an entire planet couldn't pierce. And a strength from evolving under the harsh gravity that means we have absolutely no hope of outrunning them on Earth. That's pretty much the ultimate predator. All we can do is surrender the world to these things and take what little respite they give us. But what makes them even stranger is they have no real motivation after landing on Earth. No clear sentience or goal, with the infamous white ball clip questioning why they don't even eat their prey. Just like the brown tree snake, the Death Angel is a freak accident that introduced a far too powerful species into a helpless ecosystem for all hell to break loose. It's just this time we're the victims, not the perpetrators. It all stems back to Krenitzi's original idea. The point of creating the Death Angels without any sentient level of intelligence or wanting, they're a symbol of the raw power of nature, with their presence on this world enough to place their own existence into question. That's why my absolute favourite scene of the first film was the moment Evelyn reaches that exact point. You can imagine how if a species even remotely as powerful invaded Earth, whether from the skies or by our own hands, our lives would be almost unrecognisable. It's crazy how the introduction of a single superior species could turn humans into nothing more than cockroaches scuttling across Earth, desperately searching for cover the moment they're spotted. But that's what makes them so terrifying, how ruthlessly they dominate Earth. From the second they arrive, they're stronger, faster, bigger and more deadly than we are. The only thing we have over them is consciousness, but that's less of a blessing and more of a curse given how unstoppable they are. All that awareness gives us is an understanding of just how f***ed we are. Each film gives us a different perspective on this invasive species phenomenon. Day 1 was literally just releasing this single species out into the world and watching the chaos unfold, whereas Quiet Place had that element of chaos, but also a more narrow focus on how humanity could adapt to this new world. It was almost a POV look into what it takes for a family to survive in this new, terrifying reality, and just how different life would look. Then Part 2 had a more coherent plotline, focused on fighting back, and making it to the islands to transmit that frequency. I think the first film was the pinnacle of the series, combining that element of chaos as they invade the world, with a stark reality of surviving within it. That's why one of the best examples of perfectly setting up the bleakness of this new world just so happens to be one of the first scenes of the entire series, when Lee's son is snatched up in the blink of an eye. It shows just how dangerous this new world is, and how much we take for granted the beauty of family security because we're top of the food chain, but introduce something far superior, an invasive species of the most terrifying kind, and suddenly humanity hangs in the balance. Even that moment after Lee dies and they find each other again for the first time, as soon as they huddle together they just start to release this wave of sheer grief, but it's completely shattered seconds later when they hear the Death Angels coming again. There's not a single moment of respite in this new world for humanity, and that's where a lot of the horror element comes from. You can imagine just how terrifying it'd be to live in this world where forever looking over our shoulder. It doesn't matter how far away they are, the faintest sound, even a sneeze could be all it takes. As long as they existed in this world, we'd have to second guess every move we make, literally walking on eggshells the entire time. There has to come a point when you question if life is even worth living. But one thing I've realised is that despite how terrifying the concept of the Death Angels actually is, it's pretty interesting that in the end, humanity's consciousness still prevailed when Regan realises their weakness is high-pitched frequencies. It makes me wonder whether Kroninsky wanted the Death Angels to be not only a symbol of the brutality of nature, 
but also how resilient human nature is in always finding a way to survive. It's hard to say it for sure given they still wiped out billions of humans in the process, but the fact that even a species that powerful wasn't able to send us into extinction shows there might be a reason we're top of the food chain after all. I'm bigger than you, I'm higher in the food chain! Get in my belly! Let's just hope the Death Angels aren't a hyper adaptive species that have evolved to adapt to the harshest and most unpredictable alien environments, because if they were, it's not that far fetched to suggest they might learn to adapt to these high pitched frequencies. From what I can see, simply not raising their armour to here every time would do the trick. Even though they'd render them pretty much blind, they'd be protected from the frequencies. But however they did it, given how harsh their last planet was, I wouldn't be so sure humanity could survive the Death Angels. Who's to say their home, the planet that imploded to send them here, is their first home? Who's to say the Death Angels aren't the most adaptive, virtually immortal species out there, migrating from planet to planet destroying everything in their path? And if that truly was the case, maybe there is only one solution. 